Meet Michiano Kano, a middleman who's been jobless and living with his parents for decades now. He is one of the 17 million unfortunate Japanese people who graduated during a period unknown as the Employment Ice Age. This ice age lasted from 1991 to 2001, and during these 10 years, Japan faced an extreme economic downturn. This effectively cut millions of jobs from the economy and didn't give people like Kono any chance to become a part of the Japanese workforce. As a result, there are now millions of middle-aged men and women in Japan who don't have steady jobs. And the people who do have jobs are often forced to work long hours because they were hired at a time when the companies didn't want them. But this raises a simple yet very important question. What exactly is the employment ice age? Well, in this video, we're going to see how the socioeconomic phenomenon has been plaguing the Japanese economy. We're going to take a look at its devastating effects and also see just how exactly the government is trying to solve this problem. But in order to fully understand the story behind the fall of the Japanese economy, we need to first see how it became an economic juggernaut in the first place. As I'm sure all of you know, Japan was pretty much annihilated by the end of the Second World War. The country had spent more than $50 billion on war effort, had lost millions of people in a quarter of its industrial capacity. However, from the ashes of the World War II, the country built itself up and made a remarkable comeback in just the span of a quarter of a century. This period of astonishing growth was termed the Japanese economic miracle, and it lasted from 1950 to 1973. During this time, Japan transformed from a war-torn, resource-deprived nation into the world's second-largest economy. One of the key driving forces behind this success was a focus on export-oriented growth. Japan excelled in industries like automobiles and electronics, leading to a massive increase in exports. For instance, exports surged from a mere $231 million in 1960 to a staggering $18 billion in 1970. To achieve this status of an export powerhouse, Japan heavily invested in industrialization. It immensely developed sectors like steel, shipbuilding, and chemicals. Steel production, for instance, skyrocketed from 6 million tons in 1955 to 104 million tons in 1970. A well-educated and disciplined workforce contributed significantly and also played a crucial role. Japan emphasized heavily on educating and training its rapidly growing population. This resulted in a highly skilled labor workforce with literacy rates exceeding 90%. The presence of an extremely skilled and relatively cheaper workforce allowed the Japanese industries to be competitive in those early years. Another great decision made by the Japanese government was to invest all the money from the World Bank on infrastructure development. They spent billions of dollars on transportation and communication networks, which turned the traditional towns into ultra-modern megacities. The world's first high-speed rail network known as the Shinkansen was also introduced in 1964 and it still remains the lifeline of modern-day Japan. Such dramatic changes have helped companies like Sony and Toyota become global leaders in technology and innovation. Thanks to such corporations, Japan gained the reputation of being a global leader in high-tech industries. And these companies received a lot of government support through initiatives like the Ministry of International Trade and Industry, MITI. This one agency alone played a crucial role in developing industrial policies that turned Japan into the world's premier factory. As you can see, this period of extraordinary growth propelled Japan to become the world's second largest economy, with remarkable increases in living standards. The country had a large middle class and a workforce with ever-increasing productivity. However, this remarkable economic turnaround was not meant to last forever. By the mid-1980s, smaller recessions made it clear that the party was still finally coming to an end. But there isn't really a single factor responsible for bringing about the lost decade. In fact, the catastrophic downfall of the Japanese economy was complex and it kept becoming more and more complicated as time went by. Asset price bubble burst. However, the roots of Japan's economic woes in the 1990s can be traced back to the late 1980s when the country was first in the midst of an extraordinary asset price bubble. The Baburu Kaisai or bubble economy began in 1985 when the land prices in Tokyo and other metropolitan regions like Osaka began to skyrocket. 
the price of residential land went up from $1,250 per square meter to more than $6,000 per square meter. At its peak, things were so ridiculous that people thought that Imperial Palace in Tokyo was worth more than the entire state of California. Such a dizzying real estate boom turned the stock market bullish and by the end of 1989, the Japanese Nikkei index was trading at 40,000, which was an insane rise from its 10 to 12,000 range from just five years ago. The scale of this bubble can be understood by just how much the stock market fell in the span of only three years. By August 1992, the Nikkei index was back at 14,000, and even this was in the absolute bottom. The index kept falling all the way up to 2003 when it went below 8,000 for the first time in more than two decades. Banking Crisis The bursting of this bubble laid bare the vulnerability of the Japanese financial system. Many banks had extended substantial loans to real estate and corporate borrowers. The sharp decline in asset value set off a surge of non-performing loans. Instead of promptly addressing these issues, Japanese banks often engaged in zombie lending, where they kept insolvent companies afloat in the hope of a recovery that never materialized. This practice eroded the overall financial sector's stability and obstructed the flow of credit to viable businesses and consumers. And to make matters worse, the volume of these NPLs kept on increasing. By the end of the 90s, they made up 8% of the GDP, which further slowed recovery from this financial disaster. The Yen Problem The strength of the Japanese yen relative to other currencies presented challenges for the export-oriented industries. Thanks to the Plaza Accords of the 1985, the value of the Japanese yen went up. This also made things significantly worse for the export-driven Japanese economy. A strong yen made Japanese products more expensive for foreign buyers, impacting exports and corporate profits. It also helped Japanese competitors like South Korea, whose exports went up significantly during this period. Loss of confidence in deflation The prolonged economic slump resulted in diminished trust among both businesses and consumers. This lack of confidence triggered a self-fulfilling cycle. Businesses postponed investments in hiring, while consumers reduced their spending, further exacerbating the economic downturn. Deflation or the persistent decline in prices became a chronic issue in Japan during this period. Falling prices discouraged consumer spending because people expected that prices would be lower in the future, leading to a deflationary spiral. This effectively brought the entire economy to a screeching halt and made immediate recovery impossible. This kind of debt spiral is exactly what caused the Great Recession of the 1930s. Demographic Challenges Japan's economic struggles were significantly influenced by its demographic issues. The nation was already contending with both an aging population and a declining birth rate for decades. However, this issue became even more prominent during the last decade and the recovery period. By 2005, Japan had one of the highest median ages globally, standing in around at 43 years. Additionally, the proportion of elderly citizens aged 65 and older had reached 20% of the total population. The declining birth rate meant that the Japanese population was on a trajectory to shrink, which in turn put pressure on pension and healthcare system, while also potentially reducing consumer spending. Rising Debt This rapidly aging population meant that Japanese tax revenues was not nearly enough to help with the recovery. So, the government was forced to take enormous debts to revive the economy with stimulus packages and bank bailouts. Today, Japan's government debt exceeds 263% of its GDP, making it one of the most in-debt countries in the world. Steps taken for recovery Japan's slow economic revival after the lost decade has been a multifaceted process that involves structural reforms, monetary policies, and innovative strategies. For instance, the Japanese government has implemented structural reforms to address the issues that had hampered growth. These include deregulation in various sectors such as finance, telecommunication, and energy to encourage competition and efficiency. They have also introduced labor market reforms aimed to increase workforce flexibility and productivity. There's also been a higher induction of women in the workforce, which has allowed Japan to maintain a higher labor force despite its aging population. Abenomics was another excellent economic strategy which was introduced by the late Prime Minister Shinzo Abe. It involved three main components – monetary easing, fiscal stimulus, and structural reforms. The monetary easing aspect sought to combat deflation and lower the value of the yen, making Japanese exports more competitive globally. 
This approach had a notable impact on Japanese economy. Quantitative and Qualitative Monetary Easing QQE is another monetary policy introduced by the Bank of Japan in 2013 to stimulate the economy. It involves increasing the money supply by buying assets such as government bonds while also using forward guidance in diversifying asset purchases. This policy aims to combat deflation and promote economic growth by lowering interest rates and encouraging investment. Japan has also invested a lot of money into turning the country into a tourist dream destination. The result of their efforts have been quite staggering. The number of international tourists went up from 8.6 million in 2010 to 32 million tourists by 2019. The future? Now, Japan has made a remarkable recovery for sure, but the country still isn't out of the woods yet. Its birth rate is continuously on the decline, and this problem can't be solved without policy changes. The country will have to give incentive to its younger population to have children and start families. Another way to solve the population crisis is by simply allowing more immigration. They will have to address this problem as soon as possible or the consequences will be far-reaching. Already, the country is facing a pension crisis for its lost generation. However, if we know anything about Japan, we can be certain that this resilient nation will find a way to solve its problems sooner or later.